nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. All right, thanks. Welcome, everybody. This is our fifth uh, session for our micro nanotechnology education seminar series. Um, we're really happy uh, with so far the, what we've seen. Um, so today we're going to have uh, Dr. Kendrick Davis is going to be talking about the state of STEM education um, and looking really, really forward to having Kendrick speak and hearing about uh, the state of STEM. So uh, take it away, Kendrick. Oh, I think you're muted. <laughs> gotcha. Perfect. Right, cool. You know, you got to start it off right. <laughs> Um, thank you, Jared, for the introduction, and um, thank you, and just uh, good morning, afternoon to, to everyone. Um, really excited to be able to bring this particular series to um, to the MNT EC Center, uh, because as we look at, like, impacts of COVID-19, as we look at the impacts of sort of the racial unrest in the country, um, making sure that we have a specific and intentional focus on um, bringing equity in STEM uh, is going to be uh, really important. I know that I just want to sort of establish sort of expectations of this on um, the front end. Um, the We're going to talk about the state of education, but we're also going to talk about sort of how we bolster that and where we move to from a sort of, sort of an equity lens. Um, and just to sort of set the stage for what we're doing today, so this is going to be, you know, part presentation, but also part interactive. Um, and so this will not work if we, uh, if we're sort of not interacting, whether it's in the comment section or, you know, whether you're uh, just verbalizing things out loud. So I encourage that, I encourage it to happen at, at any time, the, the places that, uh, where there are breaks that happen, where I'll ask questions, but also if there are things that I'm saying or concepts I'm reviewing that are unfamiliar, please, please, please uh, don't hesitate to, to speak up. So I wanna start with just a, some, some ground rules. So a lot of times when we come into uh, conversations about equity and diversity, uh, there's a tendency to get defensive, right? So we talk about, you know, having better pedagogy in the classroom. We talk about having better relationships with students. And there's a sort of, there's this sort of knee jerk reaction of like, oh no, that's not me. You know, I don't need to sort of pay attention to this part, um, but let's, so let's resist that sort of like defensive posture. The second thing is, you know, let's focus on personal responsibility. It's not, no individual on this call, or even the, the collective uh, group is not going to solve every problem in education and certainly not every problem in STEM education. And so really I would uh, encourage us to focus on what is it that me and uh, what is it that I can do in my interactions with my institution, my interactions with my colleagues, students, and, and so on and so forth. Um, also ch challenge your assumptions, right? And these are, and this is not just for uh, white people, black, Asian, whoever, like we all have challenges, we all have assumptions that we have sort of developed over time um, and those assumptions and biases sort of play into how we interact with people and, and the thoughts and perceptions we have. So um, don't be afraid to challenge your assumptions and also challenge your institution's assumptions, right? Like whether those, uh, whether they're written on paper somewhere, every institution sort of by way of its design and its decisions about policies and programs is making assumptions about uh, what they believe um, or how they believe their, their interaction with the world is and how they believe their students, uh, who they believe their students to be. Uh, and then lastly, resist the temptation to be intellectually dishonest. And what I mean by that is um, we're all smart, so let's not play stupid. <laughs> so an example of that is I was at a faculty workshop. Um, <clears throat> I was at a faculty workshop and uh, on diversifying uh, faculty at Hispanic serving institutions and there was a um, there was a a person individual who was a higher ranking uh, person at Cal State system, and during our introductions we said our names and then pronouns. Uh, you know, he said his name, and then instead of him saying his pronouns, he then he took two minutes to explain how he didn't really understand it, didn't really agree with it, um, and didn't really like the idea of sort of expressing pronouns as a part of introductions. And you know, my response to that was we can't be both scholarly and stupid at the same time. We can't sort of grapple with these really complex issues and then pretend like we don't understand things like, you know, pronouns. Now, albeit social issues are, are, are more difficult to sort of toggle with and grapple with, um, but we have a good starting point, right? Um, and so let's, let's sort of bring the things we have to bear um, and, and resist the temptation to be intellectually uh, dishonest. Um, so that being said, I'm actually gonna, 
get here. So a little, a little bit about me, just to frame of the conversation. So I'm, a, I'm actually, I live on the West Coast now, but I actually am a native of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I've been on the East Coast most of my life. Um, my educational background is in a, a combination of, of engineering, so law, policy, education. Um, my undergraduate degree is in mechanical engineering. My master's in robotic engineering. Um, I have a second master's in law, and a, my PhD is in, in higher education. Um, I've worked at all levels of, of government, local, state, uh, federal government. Um, also done international work as a part of a USAID project to reform STEM education in Egypt. Um, and the most recently, before I came to California, I served as a AAAS uh, Congressional Science and Engineering Fellow, um, where I was education policy advisor to Senator Kamala Harris, which is where I met um, uh, Jared uh, and Bob. And, um, and just lastly, I'm an educational researcher and equity advocate uh, through and through. And so I think you'll see that sort of come through in, in the presentation. Okay. So one place I, I want to start with I want to start with grounding this in, in equity and sort of centering on what, what is it that we mean when we say, or what is it pe people mean when they say equity? Uh, people mean a lot of different things, but for the sake of what we're doing here in our time together, equity is really not just uh, parity and opportunity, but parity and outcome. So it's not just about creating an opportunity for, you know, vulnerable populations to do something. Really, the idea is that we're creating not just the opportunity, but also giving them the resources to make sure that opportunity turns into a positive and constructive um, outcome. Um, there are a lot of vulnerable subgroups in STEM, uh, whether it's foster youth, LGBTQ youth, uh, you know, uh, racial subgroups. Uh, for this particular presentation, we're gonna focus more on racial, uh, racial and gender disparities uh, because those tend, from a data perspective, those tend to be the factors that disparities are seen, uh, the largest disparities are seen along racial and gender lines, specifically when it comes to race. Um, and so we, because we have limited time and bandwidth, um, I want to focus on uh, those, those two in particular. So one of the things that we've, uh, and we're going to talk, we're, this is going to sort of be threaded throughout, but one of the things that, uh, the way I'd like to sort of think about how do we approach reforming STEM education, whether it's from an individual standpoint or a community standpoint? Um, and part of that is this sort of combination of uh, understanding, acting, and iterating that sort of turn on each other. Um, and really the part we're gonna focus on today is the understanding part um, and really grounding us in where are we at and where do we, uh, where are some potential places that we, we need to go. I think, you know, after that sort of understanding is established that we move toward sort of acting, right? So what are, what are things, individual things that I can do? What are things I can push our department to do uh, to improve our, um, to improve our equity? And then iterating, right? So that's, all right, now that I understand better, I'm taking actions. Are my actions having the intended consequences? And if not, uh, figuring out how to sort of, to, to reform that. And so um, this diagram should look familiar to, to all of us in some way, shape or form. It might be slightly different. Uh, but the, the, the main thrust remains the same. Um, some call this a scientific process. Uh, I've come to know this more as the engineering design process. Um, and what, and I, and I bring this up not to uh, take us through sort of this elementary sort of science uh, lesson, uh, but I bring this up really to talk about how we as sort of scientists uh, or engineers, we learn how to go, to, go through these sort of process, iterative processes but sometimes when it comes to things outside of the science and technology world, we sort of fail to use the, the skills and tools that we've been given. So we've learned how to observe. We've learned how to observe, um, you know, problems and challenges. We've learned how to sort of research the, those challenges, how far reaching they are, so on and so forth. We've learned how to prototype. We've learned how to sort of create something to test our theories, to test our, our, our knowledge of the world. Um, and then we've learned how to test. And, I, the argument that I would make is that we have not fully, when it comes to STEM education, we have not fully completed this process. We, it, it, it's, it, there's, where we are stuck is the, between testing and improving. Um, and we're stuck there because, in large part, because there is a lack of national leadership in science. Um, and I don't mean that to say that, you know, NSF is not, you know, providing leadership. I don't mean that to say, but there's no sort of coordinated sort of leadership among like local, state, and federal bodies to talk about, okay, what, where are we going? What data do we have available to us? Um, what 
uh, what progress has been made, uh, what are what is the state of some of the sort of so, uh, vulnerable subgroups in this space? There's a lack of national leadership. And honestly, under the, the last time we had any type of leadership like that was during the Obama administration, uh, where there was a really concerted effort uh, to amplify and lift up um, uh, efforts in, in science, technology, um, engineering, and math. Uh, but we, uh, we don't have to make this political. We, we know that, that that leadership no longer exists in terms of the Office of Science, Technology, Policy in much of the, the sort of federal infrastructure um, that was propping up the, the scientific enterprise. So we've known for a long time that uh, we we've known for a long time that there are challenges around uh, improving our sort of nation's um, status in, in STEM education. And one of the ways we've recognized that challenge is uh, in 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 the policy world. There are things called focusing events, and we've had several focusing events in you know throughout our our history, really in the, in the 20th century that really led us to believe, you know what, if we don't get our act together, um, we, uh, we're not going to be competitive in this global economy. Um, and so what some of the major sort of imperatives that, come, uh, that are related to STEM education is um, using STEM to strengthen the education system, right? So STEM in its very nature is a, is a, um, is a, is a, a sort of backwards by design model, right? It's sort of this, this investigative model where we sort of look at challenges and propose solutions and so on and so forth. So this inquiry by design model is something that uh, educators have latched onto. And because STEM education, uh, because STEM fields uh, naturally have that baked into them, it's become a sort of, uh, it's become a sort of motivating factor to use STEM to improve education. Um, improving workforce uh, preparedness. Um, one of the things that, and we'll talk about a little uh, later, that has been consistent is that there are low unemployment numbers, um, stubbornly low un unemployment numbers in STEM fields. And so um, that when we talk about sort of this mismatch between where the preparation is and where the jobs are, um, STEM has also come up in conversations that, all right, we need to improve our workforce, workforce preparedness. Uh, we need to improve where we are as a country. Um, improving global competitiveness. This often comes up in conversations about the, the PISA test, uh, these like standardized um, international tests um, that shows, you know, year after year, the U.S. sort of rankings in, in math and science um, continue to drop. Um, and lastly, but certainly not least, uh, a lot of uh, bolstering national defense. This has come up in, you know, in, 19, in the 1950s when the Russians launched Sputnik and beat us to, uh, beat us sort of in that initial uh, space race. Um, that was a time when we as a, a country under presidential leadership said, all right, we need to devote some resources to um, improving how we do this. Um, another focusing event was um, the Nation at Risk uh, report um, that came out, I think, in the, in the 80s that basically said, if our education system, um, the, the, the state of our education system as it was then, and really as it is now, but as it was then, um, if a foreign power had imposed our education system on us, we would have considered it an act of war. That was a major turning point um, in, in the 80s because people didn't view sort of education as a, um, people weren't sort of sure uh, what this uh, impetus for uh, STEM education was or where it was sort of taking us. Uh, but the idea that we would not be okay with that system if it was imposed onto us by a foreign power um, that was that was groundbreaking. Um, and then in the early 2000s, there was a, a series of reports called Rising Above the Gathering Storm um, that really talked about how, uh, it was really rooted in how India and China were beating us in production of, of engineers. But these were sort of like focusing events that really got a fire under us to say, all right, we've been making some good progress, but we need to, um, we need to um, continue on that journey. Um, and that's the, the, the path that we're, that we're still on. Um, Want to make sure there's no things I need to address. Cool. Okay, so sorry about that. So some data of the 1.8 million bachelor's degrees awarded um, in year 1516, about 330,000 of them, or 18 percent, were in STEM fields, right? So if we're so just from a numerical standpoint, if we're talking about um, that. Uh, STEM fields are where job uh, projections are, where growth uh, projections are in jobs, 
will there be increased opportunity? We have to do better than less than a fifth of the bachelor degrees being awarded, um, being uh, in STEM fields. And I say that because this, this uh, pipeline only trickles down as you go further. So if we're, um, these, these numbers uh, look even more troubling when we look at how many degrees um, among master's degrees are conferred in STEM fields, how many, how many degrees among PhDs are conferred um, in, in STEM fields. Uh, so we really, we really have to increase our sort of preparation um, at the bachelor's degree level if we're to, if we're to make progress. And secondly, I mentioned this uh, when it came to the uh, global competitiveness, but the STEM jobs are uh, stubbornly uh, low unemployment rates you know, across time. Um, we don't want the employment rates to, uh, unemployment rate to increase, um, but it's worth noting that um, one of the reasons that we sort of shift attention and direction to STEM fields is because of the sort of economic security that comes with securing, um, the economic security that comes with uh, pursuing these fields. Um, and then being placed into a job or, or career. Um, so I'll, I'll just read this. The number of STEM occupations grew about 1.1 million from 1960 to about 5.8 million in 2011. This represents an average annual rate of 3.3%, uh, average annual rate of 3.3%, greater than the 1.5% growth rate for the total workforce. So we know that STEM jobs are, are growing. You know that there's sort of this stubborn un unemployment um, and so that's one of the, the sort of benefits to um, the benefits we communicate to people of why they should go in the STEM fields and why it's sort of good for uh, for the country and for for the economy. One of the things I um, actually we'll we'll do this. I'll, I'll pause real quick so we can just kind of take in this graph and then I'll uh, describe it and 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 I really want to ask you all what should the main takeaway from uh, this particular um, graph be. So we're looking at STEM bachelor's degrees as a proportion of total um, and by race. And this was in uh, the 15, 16 year. So feel free to unmute yourself, uh, drop in the chat. What, what, what stands out to you about this figure? Um, what should we take away from this? I also tell my students all the time, I'm comfortable with, off I'm comfortable with awkward silence. So, <laughs> so I won't jump in to save you. <laughs> Um, I'll jump in. Please. Thank you. My, na my name is Dr. Barbara Christie, and I work at LA Harbor College, and um, I have a, a PhD in STEM education, or st science education, actually, but everything now is STEM, right? Not just science. That's so, right. um, basically, these numbers haven't changed. That's the, the really sad part. They change, obviously, by number, but not by percentage. So, you graduate around 100,000 engineers a year. And only, um, as you say, this is overall STEM, but the number of women is still 20% who are walking across the stage. And African-Americans and Latinos combined is around 11%, I think. Maybe 15, 16, it's gone up a little bit, but not significantly. Right. And, and if, you, if you had to pick one takeaway, and thank you for that. Um, if you had to, to pick one takeaway, major takeaway from this uh, figure, what would that be? And, and you can respond, feel free to respond to that, or someone else can jump in. I would say that the, the number of people, again, Hispanics, minorities are growing in population size demographically, but they're not still not getting access to STEM. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? This is not a right or wrong answer. It's just we're, we're just engaging in conversation around the data. Hi, this is Tanya Faltons. Um, with the NanoHub, and I was kind of surprised by these numbers that most of them actually, I, I might be looking at a different slide than what Barbara was looking at, but most of them um, aren't that different except the Asian block at 33% is double, you know, two to three, um, like a third to double the size of um, the other ones. That's what kind of surprised and mm -hmm. struck me about this. Yeah, and that should absolutely stick out to you. Um, the fact that the proportion and, and the way that we that we read this is, and we'll, I'll just start with the total. So the in the black column to the left, the, it basically shows that um, out of all the bachelor's degrees awarded in the country in the year school year fifteen sixteen, 
18% of those were in STEM fields. If we go to individual racial ethnic categories, let's take Asians, for example, out of all of the bachelor's degrees awarded to Asian students, 33% of them were in STEM fields. The fact that that is more than double every other subgroup except, um, except white people is noteworthy. That is absolutely, uh, I would absolutely flag that as, as a takeaway. Uh, but it's not the only one. Anything could else you, that just kind of, go ahead. Uh, could, could you uh, just maybe uh, give the percentages for each group um, for, uh, so that people who are visually impaired can know what the graph yes. says? All right, thank you. Absolutely, thank you. good point. Um, so the, uh, starting from, from left to right, so 18, out of all bachelor's degrees in, in the country, 18% of them were in STEM. Out of all bachelor's degrees awarded to white students, 18% of them were in STEM. Um, out of all bachelor's degrees awarded to black students, 12% were in STEM. Uh, that's 15% for Hispanic, 33% for Asian, 15% for Pacific uh, Islander, 14% for American Indian, Alaska Native, and 20% for two or more races. And I won't belabor the point. Excuse me, too I have a question. Uh, are all the Asians, um, you know, American born or if they come from China? Right. That's a, that's an ex, that is an excellent question. And if this was not a part of, so the, the short answer is, um, I, I'd have to dig into like the NCS to, to know, but it's likely not counting. Um, it's likely not counting international students. Um, but the, the, the question you bring up gets to a larger point of, we need better data infrastructure. We need better data infrastructure. And this, this goes along with the, when I was talking about national leadership, when you say STEM, that means different, that means something different to everybody, potentially everyone on this call or on this workshop, but it also means things different to every federal agency. You know, the U S department of education considers STEM different than the, the, um, than the NSF, even within, even within NSF, uh, the way that we talk about STEM within different grant programs changes as well. And so there's a lot of variability in how we talk about these things. But I don't know if you were, you were about to make a larger point or if that was just your question. No, that was a question because um, I know there's a lot of foreign students uh, from China. China is really aggressive, you know, and pushing STEM and, you know, uh, higher education. And so um, this would not be really representative of, you know, uh, the, um, the split in, in uh, you know, educational equity, because if they come from China, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not the same, right? It's a different category, but I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think that's a, that, that's a good point, but it, it also gets at, um, you know, what does it mean for equity when we talk about the integration of international students into the picture. Um, I, I personally would not sort of take the, the position of um, that sort of international students are not a part of the conversation uh, because when international students come to American universities, uh, those are spots, resources, um, opportunities that like all the, they're not, um, they're not endless, right? And so in some ways, if, a, if an institution has, you know, 200 seats for the incoming class, it absolutely has implications, whether we're talking about, you know, domestic born students, international students, um, all of that is a, a yeah. part of the picture. Yeah, the, the only difference is that the Chinese who come here and get a bachelor degree, they go back to China. So what does it mean for the country, you know, uh, in this yeah. regard? So there's a little bit of a difference there, uh, but that's okay. I don't want to uh, take too much time on that. Kendrick, no, you're this fine. Is Pamela Auburn. I'm in Houston, Texas. Um, but more than just international students, I'd like to know how many of these students came out of American schools for high school and how many were, you know, part of their education. They, they may be Americans now, but some of their education was from other places. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm an I, American, but I but my my K twelve was in Canada. No, absolutely, and that, that's a that's a. Um, that's a fair point and, a, and an excellent point. I, I will say when, when it comes to crunching our education data across, whether it's STEM or not, across the board, um, most, most of what we're talking about is the lion's share of, um, the lion's share of these students have gone, have had most of their education or a significant portion of their education um, in, the, in the United States. 
it's not unusual, right, for people to have, uh, for students to have had some level of their K-12 or higher education outside the U.S. Um, but from a data perspective, most of these students were, the, the lion's share of these students were, uh, had significant portions of their education inside the, the United States. Um, but I, I don't want to belabor this too long. The only other major takeaway I would say is that um, the, every, all of the sort of vulnerable subgroups, uh, Black, Hispanic, Pacific Islander, and Native students, all fall under the average. So the average is 18%. And all of those subgroups are not even achieving the average, right? And so that, that in and of itself is something that um, we may not know exactly why that is or it, why it is in every context, but it's something that attention needs to be, uh, something to which attention needs to be paid. So um, this next graph, and we're gonna do the same thing, is STEM bachelor's degrees as a proportion of the total by race, and again, in the 15-16 academic year. And what we're looking at is, I'll start from the left side, the total is, and you'll see that each pair of, um, each pair of bars adds up to 100, right? So this total is out of all the, the, the bachelor's degrees um, awarded, 58% of them went to women, 42% went to um, men. Um, out of the total, total STEM degrees, out of all the bachelor's degrees, 64% were in non-STEM fields, 36 were in STEM fields. Uh, when it comes to sort of racial subgroups for white students, um, males, of all the bachelor's degrees that went to white students, 66% 66 went to men, 34, I'm sorry, 66%, yeah, went to men, 34% went to women. Um, for black students, 55% went to men, 45 to women. For Hispanic students, 63, uh, went 63% of the bachelor's degrees went to men, 37 to women. For Asians, it's 60 to men, 40 to women. Uh, Pacific Islanders, 64 to men, 36 to women. And for American Indians, 62 to men and 38 to, to women. And there's also a two or more race category where 60% of those degrees went to men and 40 to women. I almost feel silly asking what the overall, <laughs> what the main takeaway from this graph is, but, but I'll ask anyway. Well, there's for sure always more men than women. That is <laughs> a clear, a, a clear conclusion. Absolutely. But and it clear conclusion, but incomplete, right? So the, it's it's clear from that uh, women are earning more bachelor's degrees uh, overall um, than men. But when it comes to STEM fields across all racial ethnic subgroups that men are significantly outperforming women in STEM degrees. Um, and we know that from the literature, that's not because of interest. Uh, we know it's because of a number of other things that we're gonna get into uh, later. But any other things to jump out or, or things we wanna uh, to talk about on, the, on this, this figure? Well, could I interject that, um, w where do you put uh, psychology? It's often the biggest major on campus. It's often predominantly female. If you call psychology STEM, then these numbers are entirely different. No, absolutely. And so the, and this again goes back to um, wanting the desire to have data uniformity across sort of platforms and, and systems. Um, psychology would not be counted in here. Um, there are some education, like the National uh, Center for Education Statistics, um, some of their counts do include um, psychology or even uh, economics as a, as a STEM uh, field, uh, but these numbers um, do not. But to your point, yes, psychology um, is uh, heavily weighed toward um, women and would uh, would affect these numbers. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, I'll just jump in real quick again as Barbara Christie. Just again, I think um, women uh, and minorities do not get encouraged to study STEM at young ages, and they have the least likely chance to have a trained teacher in the STEM field as they're growing up in junior high and high school, that if you go to the, the low-income areas, uh, whether even in the rural areas, if it's, um, it's, just, it's just an early education. If you don't have a, a strong early education in STEM, then you're going to have a weaker chance of going to college to study STEM. No, absolutely. And, and, um, oh, and, and actually, Barbara, what you're getting at is um, 
some of the barriers to, to STEM success, which we're going to talk about in, in a, a little bit. Um, I mean, and listen, when we get there, I'm just going to let you take over and <laughs> talk about why we're not where we are or where we should be. Um, but no, we're, we're definitely going to get into like, what are the, what are some of those like really intractable barriers to some success uh, that have come up time and time again in literature that have been addressed in, you know, workshops and government reports and, and so on and so forth. Um, so we will definitely get to that. But it, any other sort of just main takeaways on this graph uh, before we move on? Hi, this is Tanya. And Hi, Tanya. Um, something that I see that's really interesting is that among all of these groups, equity, gender equity is closest for the Black students. Mm. Yes, thank you. What else? I, I have no expert, I do have no reason or explanation for why that is. Um, but again, the we have to start by the, our starting point is looking at the data, identifying the patterns, and seeing where, where things require attention. So that's, that's a really good um, uh, takeaway. Uh, anything else jump out to anybody else? Hi, hi Kendrick. Right. I think one of the things I've been, because a lot of people have been talking about psychology, I, I would love to see a breakdown with disciplines that are, you know, how's biology doing? How's chemistry doing? How's mathematics doing? Computer science? And for instance, I think biology has been improving quite a bit um, over the past 10 years in their data. And maybe going to the biologist and being like, you know, what is it that you're doing in biology and psychology that is being more inclusive of females and minority groups and kind of use them as an example of, hey, let's try this in chemistry or physics or math or engineering, where honestly, we're probably seeing the most uh, disparity between the groups. Yeah, and, and Jared, that's a that's an excellent question. And what you're what you're saying and what um, what you're getting at and what uh, someone else who comments is getting at as well is, you know, these are data is important for a couple of reasons, right? Like it gives us the overall pattern, but it also um, depending on how we use it or how we look at it, if 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 we don't use it correctly, we could mask some of the other things happening sort of under the data. So it's absolutely true that within some of these fields. In the sort of like more physical uh, physical sciences, or what we call, uh, I don't use the term hard sciences. Um, we know that they're disproportionately represent uh, men are represented in those fields. Uh, we know that when it comes to the um, what they call softer sciences, and again, I don't endorse that language, uh, like psychology and biology, things uh, fields that are more closely related to the human connection. The literature says that or shows that uh, women tend to to go toward those fields, um, and so there yes progress has been made there are some fields that are doing better than others but overall um there's still uh, there's still a lot of work to do the other thing is I, i'm i'm curious and that this would have to be the probably a separate sort of uh study the level to which the numbers in the, the sort of biology and psychology are as a result of students self-selection into these fields like obviously you have to pick a major right but i wonder if it's i think it's more a function of self-selection than it is the sort of institution creating an environment that invites students to be a part of it, right? And so if I can self-select to be a part of it, but that doesn't mean that my res my institution is properly resourced to help me get through. Um, and so the those higher numbers, uh, the fields where there are higher numbers of women involved, um, I just kind of wonder if that's more of a function of just there are more women self-selecting in that particular institution, or it's a function of, or it's more of a function of how the institution is sort of creating that environment and recruiting um, or compelling students to sort of be a part of it. Uh, but that's a good point. All right. Um, can we, I don't know um, how so I'm doing in, this, but yeah, can we like I, Jared is in charge of the poll question today because, uh, okay. and, and we're going to see how this goes. So here I'm going, here's a poll question that we have. What is the most appropriate definition of equity? go I launched the poll awesome yeah, if everyone could uh, take about 45 seconds to a minute this is a nice time for a stretch break kind of our mid our mid seminar right. poll break <laughs> give us a chance to maybe get off of zoom for one second hey Jared the third option um, is cut off we can't read the whole thing Maybe it says the same as the top two. I think they're all cut off. 
Oh, for me, it's just the last one. Maybe I can restretch the window or something. No. <laughs> so, yeah, I... I was in charge of the poll question, so anything that went wrong, it's it's my fault, not not anyone else's. <laughs> so, Jared, as I as I can read you these, read those all out, uh, Jared? Oh, Jared, yes. as, I, as I read these, A equals B equals C, unless I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, so, what is the most appropriate definition of equity? The first response is prioritizing the availability of opportunity for minoritized students to have equal participation in educational programs that can close the achievement gap in student success and completion. So that's really looking at achievement gap. Uh, the second one is prioritizing the creation of opportunity for minoritized students to have equal participation and outcomes in educational programs that can close. Did I? <laughs> I think I copied and pasted the exact same answer in every single one. No, it's slightly different because one oh, of it? them is opportunity. One of them is opportunity. Yeah, oh, hold on. Yeah, but outcomes. The first and third oh. ones are the same. Oh, man. But I can't read the third one. The second <laughs> one is a little bit different. All right, yeah, the second one, prioritizing the creation of opportunity for minoritized oh, students yeah. to have equal representation. Boy, I am. They're all slightly different, folks. Okay. They are all, yeah. They're all slightly different. <laughs> Um, because the first one is talking about availability of opportunity, the second one oh, is the creation of opportunity, opportunity and, creation and the third of opportunity. one is the equal representation educational programs. Okay. So yeah. they're all they're each a little bit different. Okay, sorry, yeah, I, I see that now. And I think this is a great example of how this type of multiple choice question can really confuse our students. <laughs> so making it more obvious what we're focusing on could be helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. But okay, well, thanks. I'm gonna end the polling and we're gonna get back. I'm gonna, uh, so at the end of the poll, what we had, a uh, the number one answer with 15 people uh, said prioritizing the creation of opportunity for minoritized students to have equal participation and outcomes in educational programs that can close the achievement gap in student success and completion. So basically creating an opportunity for the minoritized students to have equal participation. All right, so thank you. I'll put the share results up there um, and we will continue on with the presentation. Awesome, so I don't, <laughs> well, you all make me proud because I don't know if you were just guessing or you just did like any, meeny, miny, mo. Uh, but <laughs> number two is the most appropriate uh, definition. Um, and I, um, at least in hearing the dialogue on the poll question, it was clear that uh, you're grappling with what are the definitions, what, like with the grappling with the wording, uh, trying to understand why they're sort of like not more distinct. That was purposeful. Um, this is not intended to be a student pedagogical uh, approach, so we don't have to worry about that. But it was intentional because everything that sounds good is not the same. Um, and so the issue is, the, the issue we've been having over this time is, we keep putting out things that sound good, um, but they're not the same. And then when we go to operationalize these, you know, this, this could easily become, you know, equity mission statement or framework. But the problem is when we're not careful with our language, when we go to operationalize something, then when we start having to pick out the fact that we're talking about equal participation and outcomes, that's fundamentally different than just opportunity. Um, and so everything that sounds good is not the same. And we need to, it, it uh, the purpose was to sort of show that we need to be careful with our language because you start with language and you start operationalizing and you're operationalizing off of your language. And, and I think, you know, in the terms of STEM education, we've been a little careless on that. Um, and so I, my point is sort of pushing us in a direction, uh, pushing us to go against that sort of direction. Um, so thank you all for, for participating. Um, and the, the actual, the definition, uh, number two definition, the prioritizing the creation of opportunity for minoritized students to have equal participation and outcomes in educational programs that can close the achievement gap in student success um, and completion. That actually comes from a, um, a resource we'll talk about toward the end of the presentation from uh, Equity Talk, Equity Walk. Um, Stella Ben-Simone uh, and colleagues wrote a, a book 
um, to sort of help campuses operationalize equity on, on their uh, in their spaces. So, uh, but moving on. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, this is when it's gonna become uh, even more interactive. We're gonna talk about some of the barriers. What what does the literature say, or some of the barriers to some success? Um, and I want to sort of set the context for so why why I continue to sort of walk in this in this space. So in twenty um, my my dissertation study was on uh, black engineering, uh, the persistence of black engineering students at predominantly white institutions, um, and I did a qualitative study on at fifteen of the top uh, engineering schools um, in the country, just based on, you know, US News Report and world rankings. And what I found, um, <clears throat> I won't go through the, the sort of findings, but what I found in general was whether I was sitting with a student in Cambridge, Massachusetts, or Ithaca, New York, or, you know, Princeton, New Jersey, or Philadelphia, or, or uh, College Park, Maryland, or University of Austin, or San Diego, or Berkeley, all the students share similar experiences about what it was like to be black in their majors on campus. That to me was scary. And these are students with diverse backgrounds, some who have, you know, poor K-12 preparation, some who had immaculate K-12 preparation, some who grew up and did most of the K-12 schooling outside of the country, those who, you know, did it in the country. There, there was a great, a, um, a wide variety of background students came from, but they all had similar experiences when it came to uh, the barriers to STEM success they were experiencing in their classrooms, in their communities, and on, in the, um, on their campuses. And so these things are widespread. They're not particularized to one particular campus or a city or state. Uh, these are things that are happening across the board. And so I want to go through these and, and talk about what, what each of them means. Um, and maybe some of the ways that, that we're sort of reinforcing these things in ways that we didn't expect. So the first is culturally irrelevant uh, curricula. And really, the this gets at the idea that um, the examples that we use in our um, classes, the examples we use in assignments um, should have a diversity of perspective, right? And so, for example, well, let's take, I think the easiest, the, the easiest sort of illustration is we take this from a gender perspective. Um, having math problems or, or, you know, trigonometric problems or anything always related to sports, that is a bias. You know, you, you can open up any textbook, right? And find the example problems are always sort of geared, uh, maybe geared towards sort of sports or, or things that a particular, you know, racial subgroup might, um, uh, might participate in. Um, it, it could be uh, along uh, gender lines. If you are living in a, a densely urban populated environment, you may never have uh, played water polo or you may never have sort of experienced some of these other things that, um, you know, are, are things you don't, you don't see. And so using those as examples, can create a barrier between students understanding the technical things and them getting past the sort of like cultural part of it. Because a lot of, a lot of times what we've seen is if I don't understand the cultural part of it, I assume that I will not understand the technical expertise or the technical piece of it. Um, and so diversifying sort of the examples and things we bring into our, our classroom spaces can really help with that. The next is culturally unresponsive um, teaching practices. And really, this goes to just diversifying, um, diversifying instruction generally, right? Like everybody doesn't respond to the same things. And so, um, and again, I'm not saying uh, a lot of these things are, are things you might have heard before or they're still intuitive, uh, but they, they bear, they're worth repeating because um, if these things are widespread, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, and so deficit, deficit based uh, versus, and we're gonna have a Q&A at the end. So anything that you want me to circle back to, I can definitely do that then. Uh, Deficit-based versus asset-based mindsets. Um, it, it is it is not unusual for us as people to form ideas and attitudes about people who, based on not knowing them, but or based on what we perceive or know about people that look like them. Um, and so, it is often the case. Uh, it is often the case that even in when we talk about, and and in fact, if I can if I can sort of be self-reflective, I sort of even reinforce this in this presentation. Right. And so when we talked about like the data I presented, we're all about um, deficits in STEM. We're all about sort of what racial subgroups were not doing well, how there's gender disparities. That's deficit based. Right. Like we're not going to end there. But a lot of times, though, that's what presentations on STEM look like. <laughs> Let's just talk about all the bad things, where we're not, how much we you know, have left to go. Um, and but asset based is saying 
we know that there are vulnerable populations of students who are succeeding, not just making it through and surviving, but succeeding in these programs and succeeding at from the community college level, the four year degree to you know, open access institutions to top elite universities. And so asset based mindset says, how, what do we glean from those experiences? And how can we take the, um, how can we learn and strategize what things worked for uh, those groups um, and make that more widespread and expand it to, to other groups? Uh, microaggressions is, is another thing. And, and microaggressions are, are, are very, can often be very subtle um, and come in the form of things that, microaggressions are things that people say that you realize you're offended about later. <laughs> This is sort of the best way to describe microaggressions if, if we're not familiar. Um, and it could be something like, oh, you know, commenting on someone's, uh, commenting on uh, uh, women students' appearance. Again, it might seem innocent, but you, but it's, it's not something that should, should have a place in, in a classroom. Or at least wait till you develop a, a relationship with that person uh, to know whether that it's okay to, to engage in that way. Um, I've had, uh, I won't mention names, but my, my engineering, um, I can't even say the course, my engineering, one of my engineering professors in undergraduate school, um, pre his pre uh, spring break lecture, he gave us an opportunity for extra credit. And he said, if you take a picture of yourself, you know, doing something engineering related or, or uh, during spring break, you know, you'll get points or something. That was perfectly fine. But then when he added, and if you're a woman and you take a picture in a bikini, you'll get more points, that was inappropriate. <laughs> and those are the exact, those are the exact things that uh, a lot of times women, women will not say anything because of the power dynamics, women will not say anything, but they may leave your class and drop, drop it. Or they may even feel like I no longer have the sense of belonging that I felt like I had before. Um, and so again, there's this sort of like this locker room talk, these, these sort of things that kind of flow in the spaces that we're used to. Uh, we have to be really cognizant of whether they should continue to flow in new spaces that we're a part of. Uh, stere uh, barriers to success, uh, continued stereotype threat and imposter syndrome. Um, uh, stereotype threat is simply, I, there are certain, you know, uh, mainstream beliefs about, you know, being black in America and I, and I am concerned about fulfilling those stereotypes. And so I'm not even going to pursue this because I'm afraid that I'm going to be a part of, uh, I'm, I'm afraid that I'm going to be a part of this mindset that other people have of me. I'm imposter syndrome. I don't belong here, right? I, I don't see people to look like me. I don't belong here. Um, inequitable distribution of high impact practices. We see this most often in K-12 spaces, um, but inequitable distribution of high impact practices is really related to, we know um, from a pedagogical standpoint, um, from a recruitment outreach standpoint, we know the strategies and practices that work best, but every institution or every organization does not have the resources to put in place high impact practices. And so, and it is also true that you are least likely to have access to high impact practices or curricular materials if you're from poor neighborhoods or if you live in a poor uh, city. Um, ineffective efforts at recruiting diverse faculty um, we see this in California. There's a, um, there, as a part of the governor's budget, there was a, um, a push to diverse, there was like a, a diversifying faculty sort of component of the budget, uh, but it really wasn't, it had no teeth, right? And, and, and that's, we see a lot of these things, not just with diversity, uh, ineffective efforts at recruiting diverse faculty, but just ineffective efforts at recruiting diverse students, right? We, we sort of, um, my alma mater is Penn and, you know, I think there's a, there's a lot of work and outreach and community work that University of Pennsylvania does, engineering school does in the, in the community. Um, but one of, its, one of its most staunch recruiting practices or programs is a six week program in the summer that's $6,000. That price point alone, priced, it prices out so many students, particularly the students who live in the community of West Philadelphia. Um, and so, you know, and, and that is the sort of primary tool. Like that is that is where a lot of the energy and resources go to. And so we have to look at, okay, you might have programs that are for the purpose of recruiting, you know, underrepresented youth, but do they actually have um, the same infrastructure and resources and support that the programs um, that actually bring students into the university, like, are they the same? 
or are they sort of just these one-off nice programs that uh, that you know can either happen or they don't and like to take pictures and put them on the website. Um, so it's, it's taking account of like what are we actually doing. So what I want to do now is jump into a series of case studies. So there's, there's three total. Uh, we may not get through all. We won't get through all of them. It probably just do the, the first one. Um, but I'll, I'll read it and then we'll talk about what we're going to do. So it's your first day on campus. Um, you're excited to begin your first year calculus course. You set up your computer early just to make sure you're online. Uh, it's time to take your class. During your first class, you begin looking around at your Zoom screen and notice you're the only person of color or black person in the class. A feeling of isolation comes over you and you're wondering whether you made the right decision. Because why are there no other students of color in the class? This is a common, common experience. Um, and representation matters more than just the numbers. Representation matters um, in terms of the, your sense of how you belong in a space. Um, and we, there's, not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of imagining and revision needs to happen to understand how you would feel. Just imagine if you walked into a space where literally everyone else there was not, did not look like you or you perceived them not to have the same sort of experiences and background. That can sort of affect your attitude towards your major and whether you feel like um, you belong and the extent to which you engage in activities. Um, so we'll, I do, I wanna skip to the third case study to actually engage in, in conversation about this. In the spring semester, uh, in the spring semester, you're convinced online learning is not working for you. You had some limited experience with distance learning courses, but you were never required to attend all classes online. Learning chemistry online is challenging, and you're quite sure it's your professor's first time teaching as well. Upper class students in your major tell you they also hated the same chemistry course in which you're enrolled and suggest that you perhaps uh, wait to take it in a community college over the summer. You're hesitant because you're not sure you can afford a summer course and don't want to burden your family, and you're wondering if you should just push through, um, push through or salvage your, your summer. Um, I really just want to pause it for just reactions like what's what's happening here uh, what we've seen stories like this right or parts of uh, or parts of stories like this and what typically happens with those students where do they go where do they get support Or just what's your general reaction? Well, I, I, I feel like I'm dominating, but I'll just jump in. I mean, there are a lot of, um, I've run programs that are like the, the, um, the STEM programs to, you know, the pipeline. So many of us uh, here today are on government grants that are designed, uh, for, for instance, I'm on the uh, STEM HSI Title III grant. It's $6 million at my institution. And... It's, it's based on the fact that, you know, we, we run programs. We all kind of know the playbook on trying to engage our students. And um, it, it's an effective playbook, but it's, it's, uh, it's like uh, Linda Darling Hammond, um, our beloved educator expert, um, says it's like Swiss cheese. You have holes that are of pockets of, of a very successful programs at institutions, but it's not overall. So you can't get traction unless it's a more of an overall institutionalized support system rather than just programs that are uh, designed to help. That's what I have to say. Awesome. Thank you for that. Any other reactions or reflections? And they don't necessarily have to be about this specific um, the specific components of this case, but it could be something that this, you know, reading through this case reminded you of. Mm -hmm. you know, I guess um, it reminded I... me of uh, my own experience as an undergrad when you do run into lousy teaching and you have choices. Uh, and the advice the may the actually be good. I don't know how to get them. Get them back. So at any rate, I mean, the, the option of going to a, to a community college, you know, that we, we certainly need to grease those kids more societally as well. I mean, that, that should be a low cost or no cost route for most students, you know, in this situation and others. Right, right. Yeah, Thank you for that. 
as a dean, I get a lot of people coming to me with this very problem and have over the yeah. past eight months, six months, however long it's been. And um, what I, uh, you know, first of all, they're brave to come straight to the dean and I'm, I'm glad that they do. And uh, when they do come to me, I try to find out, help them figure out how to solve the problem. What have you done? What could be done? Does the teacher know this is a problem? You know, just spec out what, what, what is the real situation? You know, and have you tried what needs trying? How, here's the help we can give you just so they can make an informed decision because this case study looks like somebody who doesn't have the ability to make a, an informed decision. Right. I know we're, we're, we're running low on time. So thank, thank you for, for those who chimed in. Um, what I want to say is, and the reason I wanted to just sort of highlight this case is because on reading it, there, there's no racial implications of anything um, in, in this, this case. Right, like this is an experience that anybody could have, right? Whether your whatever your background is, what socioeconomically, racially, anybody could have this experience. But what I'm trying to draw attention to is the fact that these experiences are disproportionately experienced by poor people and people of color and, and first generation and women students, um, but also that the historical practices have created a situation or sort of our, our historical practices have created a situation where this case is disproportionately experienced by people of color. And so if you're concerned about whether you're able to afford a course, um, it, it is in some way tied to just the continued economic disenfranchisement of, of, um, of people of color in this country. Like it's tied to that. If you're, if you're in, a, in a poor K-12 uh, district or if you're in an under-resourced K-12 district, um, those things are related to the fact that you, uh, housing discrimination practices that the federal government sort of facilitated that leave you and generations of you stuck in those neighborhoods and, and stuck in neighborhoods with poor, um, with low tax capacity to fund education. And when you're poorly funding education, you're certainly not about to adequately fund STEM education. Um, and so it's, it's good that we all see ourselves or people we know that are part of this. We also have to understand the, the sort of historical implications of why people of color may experience these things uh, more. So wrapping up, I want to just draw attention to- Well, Ken, there's a Kendrick, Kendrick we, yeah. we have a name for classes like that. We ourselves call them weeder classes. Right. And they're just, they're, they're weeding out, they're, they're, they have a disproportionate weeding effect, but we call them, we ourselves call them weeder courses. Right. No, absolutely, and that that is certainly terminology I'm familiar with. Um, and you know, I, I have been uh, I've been encouraged by the fact that I feel like more and more faculty are getting away from using that language or sort of taking that approach. Uh, but to your point, that's widespread, right? Like, let's take the, this 300, 400, 5 person, you know, introductory chemistry course, and you know, design. There, there are instructors who literally design their correct their instructional materials in a way that um you know in a way that is uh doesn't sort of reflect the average expectation of knowledge but it expects the sort of uh well above average so they can to your point we students out that is we have to move away from that that is unproductive it's unhelpful um and it does no benefit to the individual or the institution um and well, but we continue to do it because can, that's what we're used to right we can stop calling them weeder courses but they still have that effect. That is, I think weeder courses is an ex is an accurate uh, description of them, and it, it's just they're mm -hmm. they're doing more weeding. Yeah, exactly. By their very nature, and my and my my only point is like we we need to change our language and our practices. Um, so so your point is, is well taken. Um, so there, there's a uh, NSF has a, a STEM education uh, data site with resources and uh, just like overall data and trends. So I would definitely encourage you all. And I didn't realize the actual link is not on here, but if you just uh, Google um, STEM education data, NSF, uh, this will likely be the first thing that pops up. But I, I would encourage you all to explore um, this site just to uh, see what else is out there, sort of orient yourself to the types of data that are available in STEM education. Um, and then uh, lastly, 
uh, these are some of the, I told you that the point of, uh, really the idea of this workshop is to hone in on the understanding part. Um, and part of the, the understanding is, is taking personal responsibility for your learning, right? Like exactly what we tell students. You have to take personal responsibility for your learning. Um, and so these are some resources that are really good starting points in just kind of getting outside the bubble of like the technical knowledge of, of, of STEM and, and engineering um, and into how are these things affecting us as a society. Um, in the bottom right hand corner is like the equity talk, the equity walk book I referenced um, earlier uh, where we borrowed our definition of, of equity. Um, but I really encourage you to check out any of these, uh, any of these books. Um, Weapons of Math Destruction and Algorithms of Oppression are two of my favorite, um, but honestly, any of them are, are good starting points for um, this journey toward equity. So with that, I will um, stop and um, ask if you all have any questions. This is Terry, and I actually have a comment that came to me, you know, when Jim brought up weeder classes. And it made me realize in that conversation, if we removed barriers and got more of those people through those classes rather than having them just bounce off and leave, you know, that could be a big portion of solving our STEM numbers. Because Absolutely. if they get through those classes, they really might be on a pathway that they love, or we could get them on these pathways and keep them there. A absolutely. And, and one of the things that, um, I used to, when I was working the mayor's office in Philadelphia, I was our city's liaison to the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And in 2011, I think it was 2011, 2012, uh, PCAST, the President's uh, Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, uh, they come with, they come with like, reports uh, every two years or every year. But I think the 2011 report talked about um, the, the challenge we're having in STEM, but it also said that, you know, the most efficient way, the most efficient way and affordable, the most efficient and affordable way of us solving the STEM problem is retention. Keeping people who are already in the pipeline, keeping and engaging people who already committed, who, who moved on campus, who have attended classes, retention, so your, your point is well taken and one that's reflected in these PCAST reports that retention um, of even 60% would get us to the numbers that, we, that we're trying to get to or even more. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. 